Hey there wildlife warriors, get ready for the Conservationist Assemble podcast where we team up with the planet's mightiest defenders to learn about the diverse species and landscapes that make our world so amazing. Today's episode is all about black hornbills and we've got a special guest who's an expert on these amazing birds. Let's give a warm welcome to Tom Clark. Tom, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. How's it going? Yeah, really well. Really well. How are you? You all good? Yeah, really well, thank you. I'm happy to hear you're doing good and I'm thrilled to be discussing hornbills with you and I can't wait to hear your thoughts. So we'll get going if if that's okay. Yeah, all good with me. Fantastic. So I guess the first place to start is, is can you tell us about black hornbills? Yeah, so uh, black hornbills are kind of like a small to medium sized Asian hornbill. Um get their name obviously because they're predominantly black in in their coloration but uh, um, the males actually have kind of like a, a white white I should say a white cask a white bill a white beak whatever you want to call it uh, and then uh, the females uh, actually have a black one so they're one of a few hornbill species which are actually sexually dimorphic so quite unique uh, some people might look at them and think they're they're boring but I think they're really 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 interesting so they're they're a cool animal to work with. Fantastic. And, and kind of where whereabouts are they found? Yeah, so I mean, way back when they were initially actually called the Malayan black hornbill. Um, so they are from uh, sort of like uh, Asian region, Southeast Asia throughout there, but they are found in more places than uh, obviously just Malaysia. So that's why they kind of got reclassified as just black hornbill now. So they are found in a few different areas, which is obviously a good thing. Um, being more of them widespread is, is definitely a, a good thing for the species. Yeah, definitely. And so that's quite recent that, that we kind of discovered that they, they don't just exist in Malaysia. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've been working with them for well, I've been working in a place with, with hornbills for uh, or black hornbills for 15 years, 16 years now. So um, when I first started, they, they were Malayan blacks. And it's literally probably only in the last seven or eight years, I would say, hazard a guess that they, they were yeah reclassified as such as uh, as black hornbill. Oh, that's incredible. And it's, it's kind of good to know that 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 can happen. So what are the classifications for, for black hornbills and, and their population trend despite maybe them being found in more places? Yeah, so uh, there's actually not that much really known of black hornbills out in the wild. Uh, they're a bit of a, a hard species for people to kind of find and track and trace despite obviously finding them in, in other areas and stuff now. But um, currently on um, they're actually classified as, as vulnerable uh, with a declining population um so which obviously is not great um but that is kind of a common thing for a lot of the the, the species of animals from from the area uh, that these guys are, are found so um yeah not great but still definitely things that are, are being done and can be done to help the species as well as many others that live in that, that area fantastic and we'll, yeah we'll get into to those things i'm sure as there's lots to discuss so where are the threats to black hornbills coming from? Yeah, so the kind of biggest threats really is, is deforestation and, and loss of habitat. Um, that's kind of like one of the biggest threats facing them. Uh, hornbills, um, maybe not specifically black hornbills, but other types of Asian hornbills in that area have in the past also been kind of hunted for their, their beaks. Um, so um, mainly, mostly for ornamental reasons. Um, and then, yeah, at, at times, I believe they were also used for traditional medicines of, of some kind as well, um, but mostly ornamental. I know with the, the helmeted uh, hornbill, um, if you actually had one of those beaks, it was seen as a, a sign of wealth and, and stuff like that. So um, that, that used to be quite a quite a big problem, but uh, something that is improving with more education being provided to, to the local people where these hornbills are found uh, through numerous different conservation charities. So, yeah, biggest threats, deforestation is still still kind of that one. But um, and then, yeah, hunting is is another one. That leads nicely into our next point then. You mentioned the, the conservation charities that, that are providing these levels of education. And, and what are those in situ conservation charities that, that we should be, be aware of? Yeah, so um, one that we support is uh, Hutan. Um, Hutan don't just really specialise in hornbills. They specialise in the whole area that these hornbills are found. Uh, they're, they're biggest specialities are, are actually orangutans and uh, elephants um, but they also work uh, to help with hornbills as well and there is like a little sub charity from that called Gaia 
um, who they, they work with. Um, and essentially what they try to do to help hornbills is they actually put up artificial nest boxes. Um, so uh, hornbills, as we'll find out, and I'm sure many people know, they, they nest within trees, uh, hollowed out trees from other animals such as bears and um, other animals like that. Um, and obviously, as trees get cut down, there's less places for, for these uh, animals to be able to do that. So um, they'll actually yeah, put artificial nest boxes like really high up in the air um, that hornbills uh, can use. And they've actually, to kind of link it back to kind of my personal thing with working in a zoo, I've actually trialed a lot of these um, nest boxes in zoos first to make sure that they work and, and that they're not going to rot and they're not going to cause more uh, damage to the the environment and um, then actually help um but yeah hutan and uh, they've put up several um of these now and they've actually uh found four different species of hornbill actually nesting in them they haven't seen any black hornbills yet but they've uh, <laughs> uh they've, they've, they've seen others and and they're all in the same areas but yeah interestingly although there's lots of hornbills living in those areas they'll they'll kind of they'll have ones which tend to nest like on the edges of the forest and ones that will nest much much deeper in in the forest as well so yeah quite quite a bit of a job for the people that have to trek out into the woods to try and hoist these uh, massive uh, nest boxes up into the trees uh, i know someone who, who went to do it and he said it was one of the hardest jobs he's ever done in his life um so um but yeah uh, they're, they're a really really cool um charity because yeah it's not just the physical things like that as well they do a lot of education with the, the local people and and try to teach the locals that um working with the animals can be as profitable for them as actually you know the hunting and the killing and the the deforestation and the everything like that as well so um that that equally if not more so plays a, a more important role uh, than the putting nest boxes up and stuff as well that's very cool i didn't know that about the nest boxes and and them being trialed in in zoos prior to them being rolled out in the wild and um, because that's certainly kind of when you think about how zoos support these conservation charities it's not necessarily the way that you think so yeah support. yeah 100 percent. yeah you know the what most people think is donate money and obviously that is a, a really important thing but with so many conservation and research that's been done out uh in in situ you know a lot of the time is trialed and tested ex situ in zoos first so um that that can play a really really important role um as well as obviously the financial side of things as well so are there then any other actions that, that zoos are taking to help conserve black hornbills? Yeah, so uh, obviously ex situ breeding programs um, are really important, um, as well as you know education uh, to the general public as, as well that aren't living in those areas. So um, breeding programs are obviously really, really important. Um, I'm part of the Black Hornbill Species Committee uh, that kind of meets and, and helps kind of decide what, what the next stages are for black hornbills, which is a little bit tricky uh, in, in Europe for uh, or in EASA, I should say, for a few reasons. Um, one of the biggest ones being Brexit is being a bit of a, a problem. There's obviously quite a few hornbill, black hornbills in UK zoos that just we can't move to European collections at the moment because there are lots of issues with uh, microchips and paperwork and all things along the lines of that, which is just making it really, really difficult. Um, but the other difficulty is that there's not that many of them either. So in uh, European zoos, as part of the breeding program, I believe the last um, count up was around 24 individuals wow. across the whole of uh, European zoos, which uh, obviously is not a lot. Uh, now, we do know there are more in, in, in captivity in zoos that just aren't part of the breeding program. So a lot of work needs to be done into researching where they came from, who has them, do people want to be part of the, the breeding program um, as well. So um, there is, it's not all, all doom and gloom. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of quite a few successful breedings at my, at my collection, Paradise Wildlife Park, Hofstra Zoo now, uh, as well as Painton has, has bred them in years gone by. Uh, and I believe Drayton Manor has uh, bred them as well as bird world although i think bird world are not actually part of the breeding program which is one of the collections we're trying to get on board uh, with a breeding program which would be amazing yeah it would be amazing and and so aside from kind of collating and, and trying to collaborate all of these these hopefully a breeding population what are some of the other roles of of the hornbill uh, species committee 
Yeah, so uh, mo- mostly like yeah, helping the the stub bookkeeper like make decisions on on where birds might need to go. Um, but we're also oh, um, kind of involved in you know the management of the species. What's best practices for looking after the species in, in captivity, um, and and doing that. I mean the the best practice guidelines for hornbills um, currently uh, for EASA um, actually date back to two thousand and one as their last kind of like publishing and editing I wasn't even working in zoos uh, <laughs> when that was uh, done and I've been working in zoos for a while so um, that obviously needs a bit of update and there's still loads of relevant information in there in fact I pretty much got most of my information of you know breeding and things like that from that that book so it's still really really relevant and, and that's obviously helped us to be able to to breed the black hornbills successfully here um but yeah definitely needs needs updating um and that's something we're all kind of working towards but it, it's a process it take, takes time we're, we're all you know working a full-time job as well as trying to to commit to that as well so and what kind of background of members is there like a range of background of members of the species committee or are you all zookeepers or is there like a, a... um so generally zookeepers we do have uh some vets on there as well um but the range of zookeepers is quite varied as well so when i first started on it i was deputy uh head of the of the bird section here um and when i went into my first meeting i was in there with a load of curators <laughs> and uh, another like sort of section lead, and i was like oh god this feels a bit daunting but there there is other keepers that aren't um that aren't section leaders and stuff like that on it as well um so yeah so it's quite quite varied um they generally meet in person at the iaza um conference uh, once a year and then we just have like the odd email exchange and sometimes a zoom meeting or insert other uh <laughs> you know meeting platform online in in there and sure. um, so uh teams and whatnot but um yeah so it, it's it's not all the time it's very much like a we have this uh situation we need to chat about um can you meet here or shall we just do it over email get it sorted as, as yeah. quick as we can so and what and what would you say that, that level of networking is done for for your career um it's that's a, that's a very good question <laughs> um but in the sense of i think it's actually made me realize that i'm more knowledgeable than i thought i was uh initially um but kind of you know made me realize that you know there is a, a a step ladder to the top there is a way working to to get higher and stuff and that actually even your cur- curators and everything like that that there's normal people and uh, that we're doing what what you know younger people younger keepers were doing at one point and we're all kind of you know aiming for the same same thing it's obviously made me when asking for advice on things that the hornbills made that so much easier because you know people that have been working with them for 30 40 50 years in in some cases that you know is really important but it's also made me an approachable person for lots of other people within the industry as well they know that i'm on on the the, the committee and if they've got any questions they know that they can come and ask me and i'm always more than happy to you know help people um with with any questions whatever it is it point them in the right direction um tell them that it's a terrible idea tell them it's a great idea tell them <laughs> i have absolutely no if it's i don't know if it's a good idea try it see what happens you know um or just being that like person who can just kind of go yeah that i'd give it a go you know i don't, don't see anything bad that can happen with that so um, i'm very keen for people you know to trial trial things and, and learn from things as long as it's obviously safe for the animals to, to do mm. so zookeeping is yeah is so network focused at the moment isn't it a hundred percent like i mean i i think back to when i very very first started and the idea of talking to someone from another zoo was just like blasphemy like <laughs> can't, can't do that like oh they're scary oh no they work there you can't speak to them they're way better than us and and i, I just that's just not the case like you know there's there's some super knowledgeable people working in the smallest collections and they'll have the best you know knowledge for the situation that you need and i, I feel like everyone is so much more willing to give their help and ad- advice on, on things than they ever ever used to be and that is definitely something we need to to tap into a lot more be that going to conferences be that email exchanges be that podcasts like this you know whatever it is um it's, it's definitely a super important thing to ensure that we're doing the best for the animals that we're working bringing with. it back to hornbills uh, how can 
everybody get involved with hornbill conservation, even if they're not directly involved with them? Um, I guess that's a, a, a good question, really. Um, again, you know, if, you, if you're lucky to have a bit of spare change, then donating to these charities or, you know, visiting zoos that, you know, have these, these animals um, plays, plays a big part as well. Um, and just, again, like hornbills are, for me, like a really important species for the whole ecosystems. You know, they eat lots of fruit and they are one of the biggest dispersers of, of seeds for, for fruits uh, in the rainforest. So without hornbills going around, you know, pooing everywhere as they do and throwing food everywhere as they do, you know, you wouldn't have half as many like fruit bearing trees that then feed your sun bears and feed all your orangutans and feed all your other animals. So, you know, hornbills are quite key for the survival of many many species um in, in that rainforest so even just like helping to try and improve the areas that they live in if you're not working directly with hornbills if you're working with orangutans you will probably in turn end up helping hornbills um but yeah as for people you know not within zoos or even in with zoos you know just visiting zoos that you know have these species and um you know you can see on their websites what what conservation strategies they support and and Therefore, you can, you know, go to those knowing that you're going to be supporting those charities in some way, shape or form. What was one fact about black hornbills that when you first started working with them or when you first heard it or kind of experienced it, that you're like, oh, yeah, OK, these are a cool animal. I really appreciate them. I think the so the, the noise that they make is incredible. Um, like for, it's such a weird noise that you wouldn't expect to come from a bird. Um, it does sound quite prehistoric, um, but then when you look at them, they also look quite prehistoric, and it's, it's no, <laughs> you know, it's no wonder that you know dinosaurs are very close relatives of of birds and specifically hornbills. So, um, but I mean, the fact that I think really blew my mind, and then experiencing that was how long the females nest in their nest, and the fact that. When people say, oh, yeah, they go into a tree and they like seal it all up with mud and leave a tiny little hole that the male passes food through. You're like, oh, OK. And, and then guess what? <laughs> they spend three months in that box. You're like, oh, sure. Right. And then, yeah, when it actually happens at your collection and you're like, God, I'm not going to see that bird for three months now, <laughs> apart from on the cameras that we were lucky enough to, to have on the nest boxes and stuff. So, yeah, it's a long time to spend in there and, and seeing how well the male does with collecting food and taking it to the female and the babies and yeah it's, it's really really impressive to, to spend that long in such a tiny area for three three months not only looking after yourself but looking after your chicks and and then coming out looking beautiful as ever because they <laughs> bolt whilst they're in there as well and then you you go in the box and you're thinking for the life of me this is going to smell disgusting and it's pristine because they poo out of the tiny hole as well oh, wow. and yeah uh, like it's a uh, one of the funniest things ever was the, where we had positioned our nest box. We didn't think they were going to nest in this one, but they did. It was out, out on view to the public. We had a few that were hidden, but they went in the one that was on view. And the box faced towards where the public uh, view from. Oh. And I remember like a bunch of people being up, looking in, and just this bum appearing at the hole that everyone could see, and just this poo projectile flying out <laughs> from, uh, from the hole. It is pretty, pretty funny. But yeah, I, there's so many things about hornbills, but knowing that is is and and then experiencing it is is pretty epic to to know that they can spend basically like one quarter of the year in this tiny nest box it's crazy i'm sure that definitely evokes uh quite an emotional reaction to to seeing that hornbill uh yeah presenting yeah <laughs> like people looking in and they're, they're like what's that and then yeah just this poo comes flying out it's, it's pretty hilarious kids find it funny as, yeah. as anything but uh yeah it's uh pretty comical to witness and uh do you care to uh try and do your best hornbill impression um oh god why why does everyone do this to me like, <laughs> literally on on one two three and oh, i feel like i'm plugging the show now but on that every time i do a, a scene with cameron he's like oh so what noise does a kookaburra make oh what a noise does a, a penguin make and i ended up doing all these noises but i mean it's a really oh, i you know, i i'm building myself up to it i'm like no, really i'm are. not gonna do it and then I'll, I'll try and do it and i'm gonna deafen everyone but it's I have no idea if I can do this noise, so I'm going to give it a go, and it's probably going to sound terrible, but it's like a, <laughs> uh, it's like a, 
ah, like that is, it doesn't sound too much like that, but it's similar to that, and it's very, very loud, um, and it can be heard really, really far away, because obviously the whole point of their big uh, horns, sorry, on, on top of their bills um, is to help project that volume as well, so um, it's it's not just, uh, yeah, but it, it, yeah, it doesn't See if sound we can like find that. At all. that a was... black horn bill uh, yeah. localization and, and yeah. do a comparison. Do a comparison, yeah. Horn or horn how... bill. Yeah, That'd be the how new terrible segment. it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like there's a reason why they keep asking you to make these noises. Yeah, well. I, I generally do a good job, but horn bill is not one I've ever tried before. So cheers for that, Johnny. I really <laughs> appreciate <welcome>. that. <laughs> uh, well, the podcast is, is here to enable. Talk about yourself. Where did you start? How did you get to where you are now? Yeah, so I I guess I'm I'm one of those people that you could say is institutionalized because I started at Paradise. I could say now actually I started at Paradise Wildlife Park and now I work at Hof Chizu, uh, but it is the same collection. Um, so yeah, I, I like most people probably that's get into this indri- industry. Sorry, I am. Um, work experience first um i was never supposed to do my work experience at the zoo i was actually meant to do my work experience at a physiotherapy center um, because i was you know always about sport uh the physiotherapy center went into administration about two weeks before i needed to do work experience and um just happened to stumble across the fact that paradise were taking work experience at the time um yeah did that um at the age of 15 really enjoyed it volunteered pretty much every Saturday from that day forward and when I was 17 I think it was I then got a a summer job um, where I was not only working with the animals and helping with the shows and the tours and experiences but also if I was needed to dress up as a costume character (laughs) then I would dress up as a costume character park cars I'd help park cars and then I think by the end of the summer they just forgot that I was still employed and uh yeah one thing led to another lots of courses lots of um you know further learning education whilst working and stuff and here where i am as section leader of birds at uh, half chizu i need to get used to saying half chizu at half chizu so uh <laughs> yeah so i've been in the industry for for what total including volunteering like 16 17 years now so um people can work out how old i am from that but uh <laughs> yeah a, a long time but even though I've been at the same collection for all that time, I would definitely say I feel like I've worked at three different collections because the zoo that I worked at when I very, very started here is so different to the zoo it is now. Um, so, uh, and in a good way. Um, so um, it, it's massively, massively improved. And yeah, you, you asked me a question there and I've, I've gone on for about five minutes about myself, but Absolutely. I like talking right. about myself, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Can you come on next week? Um, <laughs> so what I learned from that is, thank God, the physiotherapy place. Went into yeah, what a, what a different life I would probably have. Yeah. Um, I'd be probably massaging some person's <laughs> leg rather than uh, flying <laughs> uh, birds of prey and hornbills and breeding things and experiencing lots of really cool things in nature. So, yeah, just a bit different. Definitely a bit different. And and has there been one individual animal or species in your career that you've gained a particular attachment to or a relationship because you, like say, from the beginning, weren't always just a bird keeper? Yeah. Um, I think I, there's been different different animals at different points in my, my career. So, you know, earlier early on, I used to work with the hoof stock quite a lot, as well as um, the, the primates. Um, then I kind of had like a little stint on reptiles. Um, and definitely one of my, my favorites from that were the, the, the two monitor lizards we had. We had a boss monitor called Karoo, who was like the friendliest thing in all of the world. Uh, and then we had a big white throat monitor called um, Moses, uh, who was really, really great. I, I learned a lot from him just in terms of training. Um, he was one of the first animals I kind of like tried doing training with from from scratch um, and really kind of got me in the training bug, uh, I would say. But then, yeah, as my career's progressed on, obviously, yeah, working with 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 birds, there's been some real characters that I've worked with in, in terms of birds from numerous parrot species, um, Bobby, a salmon crested cockatoo, who I know you know quite well. Um, and uh, he was he was 
hilarious he was much loved by all the staff uh, whilst he was around sadly no longer with us but um and then um another bird that you all know is maple the great gray owl everyone knows about mine and maple's uh, <laughs> uh affinity with uh, one one another but um yeah she she again was was an amazing uh, bird again unfortunately sadly no longer with us but she was uh, she was really really cool uh, great personality fun fun to fly and train and and do things with um but then, yeah, like I said, there's so many birds that I've worked with and, and learned learned things from. Uh, I've got so many that I'm still working with today. So, um, you know, got to give a shout out to Scally, uh, the spotted eagle owl, who uh, has been here longer than most of the zookeepers yeah, have been here. Definitely. She's uh, 34 years old this year and she's been here ever uh, her whole life. So, um, and she's still going strong. So uh, she is also, yeah, pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, that was probably mean for me to say one individual animal, but uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I think I think everyone will always have that that one animal that they always reflect back on. Um, but yeah, I I have being a trainer uh, and especially free flying birds, you have to build relationships with these animals, um, and it's impossible to not. So um, I, I think, you know, person I used to work with said that their favorite animal is the one that they're working with at that, <laughs> at that present moment or doing like the new behavior with. Sure. So, um, and I, I think that definitely rings true. Yeah, that sounds very wise. And uh, would you then say that training is the, the favorite part of your role? Yeah, yeah. I, I Don't get me wrong, like, breeding the hornbills was always uh, a big achievement or like a big like target of mine that I wanted to be able to do it like the, the zoo had never bred them before but had held them as a species for a very very long time um obviously breeding the African penguins like year on year on year is 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 like fantastic achievements and stuff but animal training was definitely always my real like once I started doing it and I was like wow this is amazing like you can massively improve your animals welfare by them choosing to to participate in their husbandry let alone like the free flying and the enrichment aspects of it um and you know every year that goes by every month that goes by you learn more and more and more and, and you see your animals achieve more and more and more through their own choices and own control is the most important thing and it makes your life easier in your everyday working with them so um yeah I, I look back on how i used to do things 15 years ago even 10 seven years ago to how i do them now and it's just so so much better so much more improved and i'm sure in another five seven years time i'll look at things that i'm doing now and go wow we're doing it a lot better now than we were even doing it then so, yeah exactly yeah, there, there's been been a few occasions where i've gone oh did i really used to do like you know because obviously uh people don't know that paradise doesn't use any anklets or jesses on their they don't do tethering or anything like that with their birds but we used to and and you know i used to do that stuff and till you know myself and nikki went surely there's a, a better way of doing this and and kind of took that, that plunge into doing it over a, a good five six seven year period and look back and go god i can't believe we ever used to to do that so um but that's just how it was back then you know you and that but that's the important thing is to always look how can we do things better yeah yeah and that's definitely i think how the majority of of collections are are looking at it going forward now there's never the work is never done 100 percent. yeah i I think the the, one of the most dangerous phrases is uh, you know we've always done it that way that's how we've always done it Uh, and that's that's such a bad phrase in in some terms yeah okay you can go okay we've always done it that way that's the best way of what we've tried a new way didn't work but I, I think if you if you just write things off because you've always done it that way, then you're doing a disservice to the animals that you're working with. You know, breeding successes, training successes. What are some of your proudest achievements to date? Uh, yeah, you've mentioned the, the hornbills and, and the penguins. Would you say they're your proudest achievements or, or is there something else? That... Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, like just spring into mind, then yeah, breeding the black hornbills is definitely uh, one of my my one of my proudest achievements um but to be honest i think one of the things that i get most proud of and i don't really think about it at the time but is when you see like your junior staff like doing what you've trained them to do um like and and not just doing it well but competently and and being able to do it without you and and not only that but also trying to improve it themselves you know and that that is i I never i never would have associated myself with a person who 
enjoyed training people as well as uh, training animals i was yeah but that definitely like seeing the improvements in people and stuff is definitely a good achievement because it, it makes you comfortable that when you're not here <laughs> you know that they're going to make sensible choices sensible decisions but not only make sensible choices but have their reasons for that that as well i thought my, my mantra with my staff has always been you will you will need to make decisions when i'm not here without me as long as you have a reason why you've done that it may not be the perfect reason why but what i don't want you doing is just make just doing something but not knowing why you're doing that or or having a reason for it yeah i, I think that's definitely an achievement and just yeah all the training with the animals you know letting a, a bird out of its aviary every single day and it going flying around doing its natural thing and then bringing itself back that's that's always a and i think that's an achie- a daily achievement yeah, <laughs> for, <laughs> for that so um yeah pat yourself on the back there yeah. so then knowing what you know now what would have you what bit of advice would have you given to your younger self uh, attempting to start a career in conservation um I don't know if there's anything I necessarily would do differently because if I was to do things differently, I wouldn't be in the position I am now. Um, so I would, yeah, my first few years working in zoo, I was a bit of a, a prankster and a bit of a, <laughs> you know, like have a laugh and a joke and you're fun and everything like that. And, but again, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything I would, I would, change to be honest with you um or or i wouldn't do things any faster i wouldn't do things any slower i just i've always been a person that you know take the opportunity that is presented to you at the time don't don't you know it's good to set yourself a target but if you're just constantly focused on that target then there's so many other opportunities that you could maybe miss out on on the way because you're just so focused on i have to to achieve this so um yeah i wouldn't really change much to be honest or give myself too much advice no i think that's yeah an incredibly valid and and kind of very retrospective answer so yeah um yeah kind of, get Outside on board of with uh, working with animals and conservation i'll probably give myself a lot of advice on not <laughs> things i did but uh, within this i think i think i'm okay it's a whole different podcast <laughs> yeah and, uh, <laughs> we'll maybe get onto that one in the future <laughs> Okay, so I think, yeah, um, that has given us a, a kind of a good insight into, to, you know, the, the mindset of being a zookeeper and, and what stuff goes on behind the doors that we don't necessarily discuss all that often. So we're going to finish up the podcast with some quick fire questions, mm-hmm. just a bit fun. Like I, I will do my best to be quick fire as well. I'm sure people have uh, realised that I, I like to talk a lot. So, uh <laughs> Some 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 questions. We'll finish up with some questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, their, their time spent on them is is yet to be determined. Um, so the first last one to five dream species that you'd either love to work with or see in the wild. Uh, so most people that know me know that my numero uno number one animal that I'd love to work with at some point is California sea lions. I don't know why. I just love sea lions. I love the idea of mammals swimming in the the ocean and stuff. So uh, yeah. California sea lions. Uh, I'd love to work with. Um, I'd like to work with emperor penguins at some point, uh, or, or at least go and see them out in Antarctica, as cold as that may be. Um, so yeah, that would be quite a cool thing to see. Um, I'd obviously in the wild like to see probably most species of Asian hornbill uh, as well. So um, that would be yeah quite cool. Um, and then like kind of working with um probably from a bird perspective i'd love to obviously work with um a species of vulture old world vulture specifically um be it hooded or even egyptians or like the smaller ones i think are really really cool um and then i don't know really i'm quite open to to most species uh, to work with so yeah Let's see what ticks some boxes for mm. you outside of, of bird species yeah aquatic mammals i've always been pretty fascinated by so so then maybe this would be influenced by sea lions, maybe not one country or, or continent that you'd love to call home. Oh, I don't know. I mean, for all it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of bad about living in, in England and the UK, but it's, it's quite cool at the same time. Um, I don't know. I've, to be honest, I've always been kind of fascinated by the idea of like New Zealand or, or even, um, like Southeast Asia, somewhere uh, around there would be, I think, 
pretty pretty cool um nice varied species in uh in southeast asia as well so yeah yeah there's a lot to take in you could dig it at the very least spend a significant amount of time there mm. and uh yeah still not see a lot yeah, so, or, yeah. <laughs> still have lots or, left to see or, more, yeah have lots left to see yeah 100 percent and if there was one species from around the world that could be native to the uk then without any negative effects on the ecosystem because we've got to the uh yeah. Yeah, 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 and we yeah, playing God clearly doesn't work. Yeah, all the time. So <laughs> no, does it not? I have a... <laughs> um, yeah. What what species would you love to see in the UK? I mean, I don't live anywhere near the ocean or the sea or whatever <laughs> you want to call it, but I'd love like just to look out the door and there'd be a, a sea lion just walking along. I don't know if you've seen like there's um Neil. Oh, Neil, yeah. yeah <laughs> just how amazing would that be? Yeah. Just having this giant like marine mammal just knocking your letterbox over. That'd yeah. be great. Lying on a traffic cone. Is it is it <laughs> negative to the environment if it annoys people? Probably not, no. right? <laughs> I suppose we probably deserve <laughs> that, don't we? Um, <laughs> if you could be an animal, would it be Neil? Uh, yeah, I'd be Neil. <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Just the life, isn't it? Uh, it's, that's gonna, it's gonna be my answer to the rest of the questions now. Yeah, just Neil. 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 Neil, Neil. Neil's life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you're not working, I'd keep busy. Um, I'd knock over people's let no no um so i I have a few hobbies um I'm in a marching band uh lead a marching band uh help teach marching band uh people to be a marching band basically and stuff like that and we go around the world and play music and perform in competitions and a few years ago we was the world champions so not too bad at it either so yeah that that's probably my main kind of thing outside of work and then the other thing is uh i, I now have a lovely four month year old daughter that i get to spend time with as well so um that's uh, a whole new element to my life which is stressful but fun <laughs> Very well, yep. Yeah, huge congratulations on on that, um, and having the daughter too. No, I'm um, <laughs> huge congratulations on on having the daughter, and and yeah, um, followed your your marching band work for for a long time. It's certainly quite a unique hobby, isn't it? It's not something that you, you yeah. hear a lot of people uh, saying it's, that it's they do. Always interesting when you say to people, "Oh, I'm in a band," and they go, "What do you play?" And I go, "Oh, I, I spit a stick and stand at the front." <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it did get you to uh, to march around Disney, Disneyland yeah. Paris, didn't you? Yeah, it was, uh, got, got to cool. do lots of things because of that band, so it's great. Yeah, yeah. Fair. Um, do you have any inspirations or like, kind of who? Yeah, who inspires you within conservation? Um, I don't. This is it's a difficult one to say really because I'm probably most inspired by the people I know. Um, you know, obvious ones that people will always say is like David Attenborough and stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, I love watching his documentaries and, and everything like that. But I wouldn't say I was ever necessarily like inspired uh, by that. But I have been inspired by people that work in the industry and I've worked with uh, specifically. Um, Nikki Plaskett is, was a, a big inspiration for me of of animal training. Um, Steve Martin as well from the animal training uh, perspective. Um, but yeah, I just get inspired by hearing what people have done, and that, that can change on a day to day. You go to a conference, and you know you see someone who you've never even heard of, and they do something really cool, and you're like, "Wow, that's amazing! I, that's that's really really cool." So, yeah, yeah. Um, that's given us David Attenborough impression. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, too much. <laughs> <laughs> Ruined it. <laughs> okay, I I. I there's 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 people you're allowed to butcher, but I don't think you can you can butcher a. Oh, that you that sounds weird. You can't butcher David Attenborough. That's yeah, definitely you can't do that. Yeah, fair enough. Get cancelled and uh, <laughs> that's that. Um, biggest hurdle of your career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, what is uh, last one then? What is one thing that you think our listeners should take away from today's episode? Um, that's a good, very good question. Um. That one, black hornbills are amazing and are not boring just because they're a medium-sized blackbird. Um, but um, also, uh, you know, just delving into the, the taboo subjects and stuff and that it's okay to not be okay and it's okay and especially okay to talk to people when you're you're not okay with these things and that, unfortunately, yeah, working with animals, bad things do happen, um, but lots of good things happen as well. So, you know, try, be true to yourself, 
be you know committed to what what you're doing um and no matter what you're doing you can make a difference to animals and wild you don't have to be one of these people climbing up in the trees and putting the nest boxes in you can do things closer to home and still make a massive difference uh, to animals out in the wild as well fantastic uh yeah very insightful and yeah i think you know lots to take away from from this episode and i think something that that everyone there's, there's something for everyone um to take yeah. away from it so tom a massive shout out to you thank you for appearing on the podcast and sharing your knowledge and, and your experience with us and certainly obviously with it with regards to to black horn wheels but also your your unwavering dedication to so, you know providing top-notch welfare and and conservation to these animals whilst enlightening all of us as to how we can get involved and, and stay positive at the same time so we wish you all the best for the rest of your career we'll be sure to uh, keep in touch with with or keep up to date with what you're doing and, and you yeah, know hopefully we'll have you back on the podcast in the future. yeah definitely I'd, I'd love to come back and you know all, all the success to you with the with the podcast and you know anyone that's listening good luck with everything you're doing as well and yeah if you see me hear me do anything at a conference wherever you are say hello i'm friendly um most of the time um so yeah just come and say hello and uh yeah let's have a chat well, that's all from the conservation symbol podcast this week thanks a million for tuning in Follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at Conservation is Assembled Pod to stay connected to the latest updates. And hey, if you found this episode as amazing as I did, be sure to like, share and leave a five-star review. This helps us spread the word and bring more conservation heroes with their fascinating stories. Thank you so much and I'll catch you all next time.